Hi, I'm Matthias Beck. I'm one of the authors of Computing the Continuous Discreetly. And in this video, we'll, we'll continue in chapter 3. We'll talk about polyhedral cones and their integer point transforms. I will start with a comment that the word cone can mean different things to different mathematicians. And so we should be careful making clear what we mean by that. Let me give you one definition, namely we're going to say that k, so this lives in some d-dimensional space, is a cone. If the following is true, so you give me any x in k and any non-negative real number, um, then lambda times x is also in k. So this includes many sets that you know as cone. So for example, the whole space, an ice cream cone, if you position the tip of the ice cream cone at the origin and then make your ice cream cone sort of indefinitely long, it's very good for ice cream lovers. But for example, the origin just by itself is a cone according to this definition. And maybe one remark already, the origin has to be in every cone. This is maybe not something that you always want. So um, we might want to append this definition immediately and say that an affine cone is a translate of what I just defined to be a cone. Really what we're interested in are polyhedral cones. So that's really typically an affine cone um, that is a polyhedron. Uh, even their definitions vary. Some books on polyhedral geometry, for example, um, don't allow the affine version of what I just wrote down. They will demand that a polyhedral cone needs to contain the origin. So it needs to be a cone in the sense of my top line here. But we will allow polyhedral cones to be affine cones. And in fact, in a little while, whenever you hear me use the word cone, I mean a polyhedral cone in this affine sense. I hope out of section 3.2, you got a sense that there's a, an intimate connection between polytopes and cones. Again, I mean polyhedral cones here. I want to quickly go through this dictionary and point out many of the parallel concepts. For example, on the polytope side, we have the convex hull description of a polytope. Here it is, it's the convex hull of finitely many points, v1 through vn. And on the conical side, you have what I would call the generated description of a polyhedral cone. Namely, you have a finite set starting with v and then w1 through wm. And your cone is defined as you're standing at v and then you go into some direction w1, w2, and so on with non-negative coefficients. Next, on the polytope side, we have a hyperplane description. Any polytope can be written like a set x such that some matrix A times x is less than or equal to some right-hand vector b. And on the polytope side, I need to demand that this set is bounded. On the cone side, if I want to have an, a cone cont containing the origin, 
And then if I have an affine cone, this gets translated. The next thing we did for polytopes was defining faces. So if you remember, yeah, for a face, we needed a supporting hyperplane, and there was a condition on that, and then we got a face from that supporting hyperplane. The absolute analogous definition um, is at work in the setting of cones. On the polytope side, at that point we had now vertices. We discussed what it means to be an integer polytope or a rational polytope. And the analogous concept on the cone side is my generator being either integral or rational. It turns out that's actually the same because you can always scale a generator by a positive real number. So on the conical side, we simply talk about rational cones if my V and the WJs are rational vectors. The next concept we had on the polytope side was that of the simplex. So this is sort of like a, a polytope and in a given dimension with the least number of vertices. The analogous concept on the cone side is a cone, again, of a given dimension with the least number of generators. If I have a d-dimensional cone, I need to have at least d generators, and such a cone will be called simplicial. And last but not least, we have the concept of a triangulation. So I'm repeating here the definition for a polytope. So for a polytope, a triangulation consists of simplices. So these deltas over here are simplices. And then we have this condition that any two simplices meet in a common phase. On the conical side, we have the exact same definition, but now what I call delta here are simplicial cones. So instead of decomposing a polytope into simplices, I will decompose a cone into simplicial cones. The next concept I'd like to talk about are integer point transforms. So we are starting with a set S in R to the D for some D. And now we're forming a formal Laurent series, sigma sub S, and the terms are Z to the M. These are Laurent monomials where M runs through all integer points in S. I'll remind you that z to the m is a shorthand for the Laurent monomial z1 to the m1 down to zd to the md. This um, formal Laurent series as sort of first and foremost a smart way of listing all integer points in S. This is a, this is a list and for reasons that will become clearer in a little while, it's a, it's a good way to list integer points in this form as exponents of these monomials. Contrary to listing, which is a, a detailed information of the integer point structure in a set, if I can somehow compute this integer point transform, and I should also say my set S is finite, then um, evaluating at um, z equals 1, 1, 1. This means I will um, specialize my sum, you know, I'm summing 1 for every uh, uh, integer point. So this is the cardinality. It's the number of integer points in S. But it can also do something in between. So for example, yeah, this, this, this will seem a little artificial right now, but um, I might do something like um, evaluating this integer point transform at all variables equal one, except for one of them, let's say the last one. Let me call this maybe W. 
You know, so what am I doing here? So I'm now summing over all integer points in S, but I only keep track of the last variable, md. Yeah, so this will be now a generating function. Maybe, let's say, my last variable could be positive or negative. Yeah, so this will be a generating function where I'm now counting all integer points in S with last variable equal to k as a generating function in the variable w. For the remainder of this video, I will show you now, at least in special cases, that we can compute integer point transforms of cones in sort of a, a methodical way. My examples will be all in two dimensions, just so we can draw pictures. So my first example is um, simply the first quadrant. So I think of my cone as um, all of this here and so if you want to write this in terms of generators, um, here's a description. Um, so, you know, I can, for example, choose the generators to two unit vectors. So I think of my, my cone as um, generated by this vector here and this vector over here. Let's compute the integer point transform. I reminded you of the definition. So what is this over here? Well, you know, I have both coordinates of my general point in this cone. The only constraint I have is that m1 and m2 are both non-negative integers. So I have I have a, a sum that I can split up into two geometric series. Like we've seen in earlier videos, so this generating function factors, excuse me, there's a z2 here, and so my integer point transform uh, has this nice rational f uh, function form, 1 over 1 minus z1 times 1 minus z2. In our second example, we're going to change the cone to um, this here, so I would like to know consider the cone generated by, again, um, a unit vector, let's say in the x1 direction, and then the vector 1, 1. Okay, so this seems like a completely new situation. Here's an integer point in this cone. Is there a smart way to list that? Well, there's something nice about my two generators, um, namely Number one, of course, they're linear independent, but more importantly, they form a Z basis of all integer points in R2. Yeah, so that means in particular that every integer point in my cone can be uniquely written as a, a linear combination with non negative integer generators. So that means my, my generating function, yeah, so if I go back to my notation, think of this as a, a monomial z to the m you know, in two variables. I can now uh, write any such m uniquely as lambda 1, 1, 1 plus lambda 2, 1, 0 where my lambdas are now non-negative integers. What should we do here? Well, I can, I can break up this uh, monomial as a, as a product of two things. And now remembering my multivariate notation, so there's a, a first term is z to the lambda 1 times vector 1, 1. So z to the 1, 1, that's just a shorthand for z1, z2. 
and I will have to take that to the power lambda 1. And since I split this up, I have a product, so my second term is a z to the 1, 0. That's just a convoluted way of saying z1, and that comes with a power lambda 2. Okay, I have to sum over all lambda 1, lambda 2, and now this factors just like before. So this is again the product of geometric series, uh, one in the variable z1, z2, and then one in the variable z1. Our last example is this cone here. So I have again my generator sort of in the first basis vector, and then my second generator is the vector 1, 3. What I'd like you to notice um, is I can't do what I did on the last two slides. So these two generators, they do form a basis of R2, but they do not form a Z basis of the integer points in R2. Yeah, so if I form the same kind of um, generating function as what I did before, so I could now again do the same sum. I'm just summing over all integer linear combination of these vectors 1, 3 and 1, 0. No problem, this will give me a, a nice product of geometric series. So what do we have here? I have a z1, uh, c2 to the third power, and then another 1 over 1 minus z1. Yeah, but I'd like you to think about, okay, which integer points am I actually capturing with that? With this generating function so far, well, you know, one geometric series captures all these points, fine. Um, another geometric series captures all these points, and then, of course, I can uh, combine. Yeah. Um, so, so far, I have sort of the generating functions of these green points. So, what's missing? For example, this point is missing. But now what I can do is I can take the set of all green points and translate it by this blue vector 1, 1. You know, so what that would give you, would give you a set that looks like just my set of green points um, sort of shifted one up. I'm going to do the same thing with this blue point here. This is 1, 2. I'd like you to convince yourself that this covers everything. So what did I do here? I started with the origin. I think of this also as a blue point. I created my geometric series that you see on the right, my product geometric series. And now if I shift everybody twice, I will cover every integer point in this cone. Okay, so how should I change my generating function over here. Well, so over here, I'm writing all possible green points. I need to be able to do a shift. Shifting an exponent means you're multiplying by another power of z. You know, so for example, if I would take this here and multiply it by um, z1 times z2, I'm shifting each of these exponent vector by the vector 1, 1, which is precisely one of my blue points. You know, so what I eventually want to do, um, if I want to capture all integer points in, in this cone, well, I'm going to take this geometric series that you see up on top, but I'm going to take it three times and each time I'm shifting it by a different vector. So first of all, I will take it as is. 
then I will take it with a shift by the vector 1, 1. And then I'll take it with a shift by the vector 1, 2. I invite you now to think about this, multiply everything out, and convince yourself that this is the integer point transform of this cone. And afterwards, to go into section 3.3 and, and read how we can do this in general. So I claim, this is sort of another way of thinking about this, I can take my uh, generators and form a, a parallel pipette that you see here in green. Yeah, so, and I think of this as a half open parallel pipette. So this parallel pipette is, is closed on the left and is, is open on top and on the right. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to tile my cone with translates of this parallel pipette. What you see here on the vertices of these translated parallel pipette are precisely the points that we computed in our first generating function. There are some points that were missing, and those points that are missing are precisely sort of the remaining points in this parallelogram. Um, and I should take the origin in here too, because that is one of the points in this half open parallelogram. And by translating my parallelogram all over the cone, you can think of I'm also translating these three points, and that's precisely um, what gives rise to this um, kind of finite generating function on top. Yeah, these three terms correspond to the three points in the parallel pipette, and my terms in the denominator correspond to the to the generators of my cone.